everyone. Welcome to the afternoon presentations by the design teams for the new public library. For those of you who weren't here this morning, I'm Barbara Behrens. I'm the elected Missoula County Auditor, and I'll be facilitating the meeting this afternoon. We have a few ground rules that we'd like to follow. First, of course, turn off your cell phones. Uh, if you need to leave the room, please do so with the minimal amount of disruption. Uh, we're only taking uh, written comments from members of the public today. There are comment sheets on the back table there, and we welcome any written comments that you have. And the presentations will be 75 minutes long with a 30-minute Q&A period to follow. This particular design team says that they welcome comments throughout their presentations and, in fact, encourage questions during their presentation. So do not hold your questions to the end in case something comes up that you would like clarification about. And with that, I'd like to introduce Don Murkies, who will be the head Project of the lead. Project lead. That's right. Thank you, Barbara. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. It is definitely our pleasure to be here today, to be invited here today, to show, share our ideas for the new Missoula Public Library. Um, I am Don Marcus. I'm a principal with Group 4 Architecture, and um, you guys have to be nice to me, though. I am a grad of MSU, so all you Grizzlies, big pity on us, Bobcats. Um, um, I'm also, let's see, a licensed architect. We're going to give you credentials to you guys, because I think that was one of the questions. Um, AIA, as well as lead accredited. Hi everybody, I'm Jeff Crouch. I'm a senior project manager with CTA Architects here in Missoula. Um, I've been a licensed architect in town some 20 years or thereabouts. Um, and I also am a member of AIA, licensed architect in the state of Montana, and I'm a lead AP. And I'm really thrilled to be part of this team. Good afternoon, Randy Rupert with CTA also here in Missoula. Uh, Notable technical skills as an architect. I am a business development <laughs> guy and a community outreach person. Um, avid user of the library, my family is with a 10 and a 5 year old. And just a little tidbit that I can show to you. I did write a children's book and it's in the library. And um, I love that. It's great. So I'm very passionate about this and happy to be here. It's called Dog Gone Day. Look it up. <laughs> <laughs> I've got cops for sale. <laughs> business development. Yes. <laughs> Good afternoon, I'm Casey O'Haran. I'm an architect in training with CTA Architects and Engineers. And I've been a patron of the library here for 31 years, proud library card holder. Um, my mom was a children's librarian here for almost 40 years, so I have a real strong passion for the library. And I'm just real happy to be here and part of the team. So thank you. And my name is David Schnee uh, from Group 4, Dawn's partner. And I'll be the project uh, design uh, lead here. And uh, we, we're going to start our presentation off right there. So we uh, know that you have been uh, imagining now for uh, many years what your new library, expanded library, can be. As uh, Andrew Carnegie uh, said, a library outranks any other one thing a community can do to benefit its people. It's a never failing spring in the mountains. Well, it says desert, but thinking about Montana <laughs> and, and the mountains here. And so you've been imagining what this can be. We've seen that in all the work that you've done before. We share that uh, dream and vision for you. And in case you the next slide. And so how many of you <coughs> chose this button? If you build it, they will read there. And some of you have other ones which we'll pick up on. These my son uh, made over the weekend uh, for it. And it will show you that we're here as strategic partners with you to help take go from something you're imagining to something that's going to be real. That's going to have impact to your community for the next generation of learners, uh, youth, like 30 years of growing in here. The next generation is going to, has yet to be born and will be using this library for generations. It's impact to the community, uh, catalyst for downtown development. Uh, this is why we ask all of you, if you haven't yet filled it out, to take your time to uh, fill out the uh, tweet cards. We'll be getting to these a little bit later to hear what your goal is and vision. What challenges do you think uh, is going to be the biggest challenge to be successful, to make this happen uh, here that we'll be most proud of when we're done? So just when you get a moment, we can uh, take care of that. So Don, grab our team. Um, well, we feel like our team is probably one of the differentiators for us from the other firms that you're interviewing. The essence of both CTA and Group 4 is that we're collaborators. We partner with other 
skilled architects across the country. And Group 4 has over 400 libraries that we plan and build. And this has definitely been a highlight of our experience for the last 40 years. I've only been there 30 plus. <laughs> um, but huge in finding a perfect partner firm that has all the best resources that we can apply to your project. Over 400 architects and engineers at CTA, more than 40 are in the Missoula office. Everything from MEP, structural, will be all in-house, integrated, cost estimating. So very much an integrated team. I wouldn't even say a joint venture. I would say seamlessly integrated is how our team is approaching this project. And the other partner with us, as we know, we need to work with the community. Absolutely the board leading, leading the call to get this building built as well as the library and the foundation. And so it's really a large partnership, a strategic partnership that it takes to get this building implemented. In addition to helping with the programming, the architectural design, Group 4 also does the FF&E, which is furniture, fixtures, and equipment, as well as the graphics for the project. So really integrated, kind of one-stop shop, seamless as you work with us. I want to talk just briefly about schedule. Um, we have put this together based on the great kind of scheduling work that was done by all of you, or some of you at least. And before we delve into really what we're talking about today in depth, which is service engagement one, which is kind of phase one, uh, I want to make sure we all remember this. And I want you to know that every day that this project goes on, we never lose sight of the prize, which is moving into a new library right now scheduled for late in 2018. But as we delve into this initial phase of work, um, there, there are a million different, or there are probably several hundred different tasks and items to be researched and, and brought forth and decided upon, but they really break into uh, uh, two basic categories, programming pre-design, conceptual, and schematic design. And everything we're going to show you today would be premised and start with deep listening. And we're going to talk a lot about how we extract and listen well to our clients, to the community, et cetera, et cetera. That is this SVW process, which we will talk about throughout. Here, this slide just reinforces that. We're talking about listening to the community, listening to the community, listening to the community, and then listening some more. Um, at the same time, listening to the real stakeholders, partners, library, library uh, board members, trustees, et cetera, et cetera. So this process, this entire phase, is premised uh, upon a really deep listening process. Um, without that, uh, we can't really move forward. So you have um, architects uh, who you're interviewing today who have lots of experience. Dom said very, uh, we're very proud of the great number of libraries. I'm going to go only over 300 of them with you now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only going to show you four of them and super quick. And to show you ones that are relevant to you and ones that have very similar types of service engagement, I like how you titled this phase one. Uh, there. Uh, the first is, and if we can go to the next slide, is the uh, Milpitas uh, Library in, uh, in the Bay Area. And it combines a historic building that used to be a grammar school and a new great expansion. So working with existing resources and new uh, projects is one that uh, is a theme throughout lots of our work. And here the main purpose of this building was to be a downtown catalyst in part of town that was really neglected. And so they really wanted the library to have some iconic characteristics to it. Next slide. In uh, Silicon Valley, the heart of Silicon Valley, Santa Clara Central Park Library. So you would think in where all these tech companies are based here that they're going to have the most whiz-bang jet, uh, uh, Jetsons-like uh, buildings. And we work in those things. Our kids are using that all the day. We want something that reflects uh, a counterpoint to that. We want something that uh, reflects uh, a place that has a more traditional uh, aspect to it, but still has civic uh, character. Our Walnut Creek Library, uh, which we'll uh, give many, uh, uh, refer back to many times here, has lots of similarities. It's very, very uh, attractive, very functional, very efficient to operate, easy to use. It weaves together a downtown and a park like context as underbuilding parking uh, in that, as did the previous project. It's a lead goal project, so a highly sustainable project. Uh, and it has uh, other aspects where we had the traditional reading room with the picture that was here before. You see a modern reading room with this nice, uh, warm. 
uh, sinuous curved uh, ceiling that just brings in the light. Uh, so when you say it's similar, is it similar to what we have now or similar to what we're going to have? Well, who thinks it's similar to what we have now? Um, <laughs> well, well, in terms of the way we interact with the public. Mm -hmm. And so it has many similar, where I think you're going in terms of, you have a fantastic library today in terms of your operations. Like you're not, uh, if you look at your library building, you would say, oh, this is an outdated library. But you have a very talented library staff, <coughs> those, uh, trustees and building committee, or you've invested in lots of updating services. You're a top library system. You need a building that's going to reflect so that. similar to what we're looking for. Yes, exactly. That's so. And our newest uh, library that just opened up, which is in Palo Alto, which is the um, uh, Mitchell Park, Palo Alto Mitchell Park Library and Community Center, is a lead platinum project. And when we talk about using partners in collaborative space, this is as a partner with a cafe, a team center, sharing space, independent access uh, for it, uh, really works and reflects the uh, aspect of my blocking. Uh, to, uh, uh, to move. So there are a lot of things there. We also just received bids for a $50 million new library and uh, we came in $4 million under budget in Dayton, Ohio. It's also a reuse and adapt and expansion of existing libraries. So lots of relevant experience uh, for you. So on to some CTA experience. And I, I want to touch briefly on what Don said about our team. Um, CTA is... Uh, the largest firm in the state, we have more lead certified professionals on staff than the rest of the state combined. So oftentimes they, people think that CTA is a, a, a huge firm. In the national spectrum, we're really not. At 400 people, we're kind of a mid-sized firm. So this partnerships with other firms, CTA is it's part of our DNA. We do it all the time, both where we're the, the big firm partnering with a small design architect, etc., or uh, in this case where we have this deep expertise coming in to partner with. So it is. Uh, absolute part of what we do every day in our business model. The other thing that I think is really critical and a differentiator about CTA, we have, one of the reasons we're the largest firm in the state is that we are integrated. I mean, we have all of these engineers, pretty much every service, every team member will be an employee of one of our two firms. In uh, what is going to be some of the busiest construction years in Missoula's history, that's going to be a really important factor because we can we can control our schedules, we can control deliverables. It also lends, you know, our lead mechanical engineer sits eight feet away from me, so I can poke my head over his cubicle and say, hey, Nathan, is this going to be cold? Um, so I just wanted to mention that every one of these projects I'm about to show you had some integrated team concept, and two or three of them had uh, multiple designers, meaning other architects, teaming up with us. Uh, this is the Montana State Fund Office building in Helena. It's a lead silver building um, right off of the gulch there. Uh, you can see a couple key design elements. One, they wanted to use the brick to harken back to the history of all those beautiful Helena buildings. At the same time, they wanted a contemporary facade. They wanted to set themselves apart from that historic, not just mimic it. Um, and, uh, and that reflects itself in the roof lines. The other really clear thing is the use of daylight and trying to get daylight into the building and experience the outdoors. One of the things that we will talk about a lot in reference to your project uh, and the outdoor patio does the same thing. The next project is the College of Southern Idaho Health Sciences building, uh, another LEED certified building. Uh, this building um, was an interesting collaboration with actually a, a LEED design firm, us doing all of the uh, architecture and engineering and then a consultant construction management, and it was designed under a, a design, I'm sorry, delivered under a design build concept. I don't know how much discussion there has been about that, but there are various ways to deliver a construction project when we finally get to the point of talking about construction. Design build is one that has been discussed in some of the questions. We're very familiar with that process. The next building, next two buildings actually. Uh, one you're all very familiar with, the first interstate bank building. We're very proud to have hung that LEED certified plaque up last year on that building. Um, and then you may have read the paper this week. Uh, this is the Stop and Bank in Billings, but we're getting ready to move forward with the Stop and Bank Tower in downtown. And uh, our LEED architect on that project has set some super aggressive LEED sustainability goals for that project as well. I wanted to briefly mention a few smaller projects. We, we don't just do large projects. Being that mid-sized firm, being just 40 people in Missoula, um, we're super proud to have done the Spectrum Space across the street. Uh, that was a fun one. Uh, and I just finished the Tom Roy Youth Home for Youth Homes. It's their teen. It's right before teens age out of their system. That's going to be the first lead platinum residential project in the state. Uh, so we can apply 
our skills as a, as a team and our horsepower on big projects or small projects. And lastly, I just wanted to mention that we're starting work on the large champion center at the University of Montana. So we're proud to be part of the community and get ready to do some exciting projects. And the last example to show is actually a conversion of a roller skating rink into a, a contemporary library. We actually had a disco ball uh, in the teen area. That was my daughter's idea uh, for it. Uh, so um, we have innovative spaces there. But we're using this just to show that we do all of the interiors and stacks and service stuff. But uh, here's going to be our first point of uh, engagement with you. And Don, if you can lead us there, you can take us to the next image. Okay. So Barbara said we encouraged participation, which is something I hope you remember about us after we leave. And we were going to start today by having our uh, board, actually the trustees, summarize to us what your, I'm going to start with Matt, morning Matt, um, what your vision for the project is and what your challenge for the project, and, and just the highest one. Um, well, the vision is, <coughs> I think it's exciting to have the children's life. So the partnership with Spectrum and the Children's and the Cat and, and the Museum. So how about the biggest challenge? Um, well, we'll be here from everybody. <laughs> <laughs> First, out the gate with the parking challenge. Great. And then how it's all going to come together. Keeping the library open. Okay. So what to do if it's phased or if it's temporary facilities? How we operate during construction. Okay. Well, we had a lot of conversations, <laughs> so I kind of feel the same way. But um, other than those, um, I like to see the library be a place where we can bring in users who aren't capable of the library users. I think having partnerships with the other institutions will do that. So to create a library that is a draw, a draw, not so much like, well, I didn't get a button, but the one that says, you know, you that they will come. I like that saying, and I think that. I think that if you provide something, somebody's going to go, wow, I want to do that. That's so excellent. I think, um, again, the parking situation is the first thing anyone ever says to me, well, we can do a parking lot. Uh, I think the challenge to decide what we're going to do um, on the existing ground. How are we going to fit all of this into the existing ground? And just to develop the functional, attractive destination library right. on the existing site. Okay, excellent. Kathy? Um, I would like to be unique okay. um, and reflective of the community. So, a landmark that reflects mm -hmm. Missoula, yeah. a new landmark in Missoula. And for Missoula. Yes. Um, challenge. Funding. Okay. And the combination of funding, right? Mm -hmm. Bond, private, mm -hmm. public. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Always, always <coughs> good to think about that early. Rita? Well, I've written down getting people to come to the library. Like Becky said, having people just screaming and having people come and come to the library. Okay. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right. Well, we are going to talk a lot about that, actually, how we partnered with communities on the implementation and lining up the funding. Margaret. Well, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but I picked the button. If you build it, you will need to buy things. My goal is a library that everyone wants to come to all the time. Okay. And the challenge is, as um, it was 23 anyway, <laughs> so we don't have that keeping us in operation while we do that people feel like they have to stay away because right. the construction side that can't be Right. So developing that temporary facilities, operations like that. plan, or phase, whatever it is. And I know, trust me, I have several uh, visions. We want maximum lease certification, a unique building that reflects our natural surroundings, and being a library that meets the needs of the community. I, my personal vision is when I read photos Pacific Northwest or Northwest and we get to Missoula that one of the two or three things you can see is the library. Okay. So and not that's just my a destination vision. in Missoula, a regional destination. But anybody who comes and is looking, what's Missoula, they'll see like two or three the things. The must-do list. Yep. It's going to be coming for the library. Excellent. And my challenge is that we'll have enough parking that people will be happy about the amount that we have. 
Okay. <laughs> and it's always a balance, right? It's a balance in the park. Well, that, that's a, you know, the ultimate thing yes. that people will be happy So what we have? Three out of five of you mentioned, or three out of six mentioned parking, right? Okay. Four. Um, and, and we heard that, too, when we were out in the community. We definitely heard that. Um, and so thank you for that. And I really wish we had the opportunity to collect everybody else's. But if you do get them filled out, Randy or Cassie will come Who by and pick them up and that's to do a quick summary of them. And we'll get back to them later in the presentation. Ideally, if we had all the time, we would be able to integrate everyone's comments into the presentation. Just but with our time limit today, I hope everyone understands. Um, but we will address and we will refine our presentation to confirm how we are going to deliver and address these challenges and deliver the vision. Um, so one of the things that is really critical, we talked about our team being integrated. Well, in terms of libraries, they're continuing to evolve and continuing to move. And if it's currently built, it's probably almost outdated. So, in terms of our project team, what we have positioned for you as part of our team is a library futurist, Joan Fry Williams, which I know Honora has heard of, and I don't know if you've had the chance to work with Joan, but she's truly amazing. We've worked with her for about the last 15 years. She's known internationally as a thought leader in library design, and she will be collaborating with us and with you to create the vision for your library. And then we all know technology is just integral, that it be seamlessly um, part of the library, that there is just no break between, oh, this is a library, oh, and there's technology. I mean, it really needs to be woven in throughout the building, the systems, and how it functions. And Carson Block is a consultant that we've been working with for about the last five years. Really great, and really both of these people share our passion for developing a vision together with the community and not coming and applying a preconceived idea to the project. So they'll be joining us and our project team. The other thing in terms of the um, approach that we have for our projects is the community input. I had the great pleasure of joining Randy um, out in front of Barbara's store a couple of weeks ago with our street kiosk. And this is just an example of how we will reach out to the community in different ways. We don't just do the community meeting and expect people to come to us. We want to get those non-users, we want to get the people who only have seen this library and don't realize that there can be collaboration spaces, there can be creation spaces, by using visuals and going to places that they're at. Yeah, this is exciting for me. I've never done this process before. So set up on the street and uh, see people come by and, and, and actually sometimes disengage and about 15 minutes come back and go, you know what, I'm probably voting for this and I'm a, I want to I make it my library. And they came back and they put the dots on. Some stayed longer than we thought they'd stay. Some wanted a lot more dots. <laughs> Sorry, we don't have 100 million to do all that, but you can't have any more dots, but I'm excited about like that. We were able to do it on the street. I was able to do it at Chief Charlotte School with uh, educators, librarians, and students which is really exciting, and you see a lot of dots on the bottom because sometimes they're not gone. <laughs> so they're like, well, I guess I like children's spaces. <laughs> um, so exciting process. We can do that with senior centers. We can do a lot of things, but it just gave me goosebumps to see people get engaged that were really passionate, people that weren't that engaged in it or weren't sure they needed a library or didn't know what the library did. I said, wow, if a library could do like this, I'm, I'm all about this. So again, I think that's about the community outreach is misinformation is our worst enemy give all people information in the world, but this really helps us get some feedback. In there. And, and we'll develop this outreach plan with you, in partnership with you. All of our tools can be leveraged. I'm not the only one who has to man this thing. I mean, Randy owned this thing within two minutes. He saw me do one patron who walked by, one Good person teacher. walked by, and he goes, give me those dots. Here, I'm doing it. And it's really effective. It can be taken to business meetings. It can be taken to chamber presentations. It's really designed to go on the road. Um, and the point is that it's here to support the community information campaign of the library. And we'll design the exhibits to support that. Another real key piece that we want to do early on in the programming phase is what Jeff mentioned in the project schedule. It's what we call a strategic visioning workshop. 
And this is a day-long workshop, and the cross-section of the community that we want involved with this we will definitely work with you on selecting them. And I'm sure all of you have some great ideas who could attend this workshop, but we would want the younger generation, we want the business leaders, we want the community leaders, your politicians, we want your current partners, Spectrum there, we want the Children's Museum there, but we also want potential partners there, right? We want, you know, people who are currently using the library from the foundation to the friends to people who aren't using the library. And you can help us create this unique vision for the Missoula Public Library. We look at things in terms of services, programs, kind of the vision in terms of what is the message of the library, and really develop through these fun, interactive uh, engagement opportunities with not quite games, isn't the right word, right word, David? How would you describe the activities that we have? Well, we have people, uh, we give people metaphors, uh, whether it be the, the Grizzlies or Mount Sentinel or uh, Apple, and uh, people uh, have to uh, try to imagine what are the attributes of those uh, um, <coughs> prompts, and then uh, which people can come up with, whether it's, and Honor, we were talking about this, and you said, Walt, we said, well, for customer service, who, did great customer service, I think. Jeff, you said, uh, Jim, you said uh, Nordstrom's, and you said uh, Walmart, two different spectrums in there. Well, what would it be like if you applied those to a library? And so it's a really engaging uh, thing we can go on for. But the purpose is to create this shared vision. And so as we're doing this workshop, when we come to the end and we're summarizing it, everyone is there, everyone has partaked, and they all are buying in to where we're headed with our vision. And that is very powerful. Okay, so another aspect that goes into our design approach is we've talked about sustainability, and Christine, you talked about environmental sustainability, but uh, you can have this lead platinum net zero uh, project, but if you couldn't afford to operate it and set shut it, how good is that? And so uh, we call it operational sustainability. We consider just as important as environmental sustainability. They're both uh, equal. And one of the early things we'll be doing is uh, looking at different options for new and uh, reuse of plus addition, and look at how many floors, uh, how many people think there should be more than five stories or higher in their minds, or how many people should be four or three, and figure out how easy it's going to be to find your way around, and how much do you have to dilute the staff across uh, by. And we do work in lots of uh, old dinosaur libraries and come in and say, hey, help us change it, where there are these separate uh, rabbit warrens of rooms and empty big desks that are there. Uh, the public can't find the helpful librarians they're looking for, and there are cost implications. So this is a, a thought that we'll be working with you at the earliest stage to determine what's the right way uh, to uh, uh, plan this library. Another aspect of that is having oper flexible operation. When this library triples in size, that is great. If you're not as trustees and public, a little bit worried about how I'm going to operate all of that uh, efficiently, you don't necessarily need to have your uh, whole big place open, every inch of it, every single hour. One of the things that we've been uh, uh, very successful on is creating flexible spaces here, the Walnut Creek Library again. The crossroads has an access that goes through in multiple stories. Each one of these portals in both floors has a grill that comes down that allows it to be segregated off and operate in different modes. So the marketplace, you guys familiar with that expression of the marketplace where your popular books are, you can pick up your home to get a sampling of technology. Uh, the cafe is located in there because you want to have that extra hours. That top slide here showing we're in the marketplace mode. So that can open up early before you need to get your whole staff open to your morning coffee on your way into work, pick up your book. And you have resources. We're going to make a much better meeting room, and you have a much better than Web Alley, technology suite and spaces and additions of spaces, disperse the conference rooms and such. We can put those together as a conference center as we did here, and that can operate after hours as well, so that uh, the uh, spectrum, you can have a board meeting after the library is closed and stay here and still use the building flexibly. And uh, one of the questions uh, that it was great to have some of your questions uh, in advance, and one of them was, well, where should the, uh, uh, what are ideas for how to locate things? And that's really one of the fun things we like to do with you, and it's not just us saying where they are. And as we start showing sketches and pieces and little diagrams, I want to first do a big preamble that we enjoy uh, 
noodling, sketching, building models, and other things. But we are not going to here to sell you on any designs. Like, this is all just to show you uh, teasers and what it's going to be. We're going to design this with you and get input. So here we did a couple of building sections and just took uh, a couple of three uh, uh, story uh, options. And if we could zoom in on this one uh, here, and said, well, how do we take these all the dozens of spaces in the library and organize them sort of by uh, thematically? And what if we were to say uh, uh, children, and what's the idea of children's discovery? You know, discovery, the uh, love of reading, of books, uh, of parenting. Um, how many of you think uh, that should be on the ground level, uh, having children on the ground level? Children. How many of you think it should maybe they should be sort of sheltered and brought up on a, on a higher level? Okay. So uh, a few of you. This is a great question. And, uh, and Town libraries across and urban libraries across the country. Our Dayton Main Library, the one that I said earlier, just fit. Uh, we had a dialogue with over a dozen uh, library directors around the country, and your list serves that uh, or participates in with people who have their children's rooms on the ground floor and where they have them up. There's issues of safety and security, which one. And they decided, and it sounds like the majority of you are leaning towards having the children down there. Their children are a gateway to all the different generations uh, there. And uh, so now we're going to. I'll show you in this scheme how these things could be. And so from that section that David just shared with you um, on section B, as we see the marketplace, we're seeing an opportunity to connect Main to Front Street. You might kind of consider that the river it kind of connects them fluidly as we go through the building. Um, having Spectrum um, at its at its brain labs in the corner locations, Children's Museum with frontage and opportunity for its own identity, but also showing the children's space here, as well as additional meeting space. Where would you envision MCAT on that? So MCAT may be on this floor, but it may be on the next floor, the create floor as well, right? And so, oh, I see. Okay. yeah, and, and, and it could be that this is the create floor and not the discover floor. Um, but those are things that we would explore with you. So we'll probably get to the second floor in a minute. We'll show you what we envisioned on CAD. Um, and this is the marketplace, um, or uh, could be the river. <laughs> Not sure yet. Um, but it is a very active space. It's where people can come. You have a mixture of everything. There is some technology here. There's your browsing collection, new popular collection. There's going to be maybe a kiosk for things going on at the university. If you're Public Communications Board. It, it's really a very, very busy, active space here. Um, as we look at the children's space, if it was located on the first floor, we may want to look and uh, explore the opportunity to create a portal, kind of more of an entry. So actually, when kids go through the portal, they're transformed, and they get to discover, and they get to find out what's going on inside the children's space. It's not necessarily all transparent, or it could be all transparent. Those are things we'll explore with you. Is that a real place? That's a real place. Yes, Which a, where is it? It's Cerritos Cerritos. Libraries is one of, uh, Joan Fry Williams had uh, awesome. done the whole experience library. And Casey was saying, as we were putting this uh, stuff together, says, well, the gnome House has got to be fully incorporated into this yeah. somehow. So, uh, and that's actually a green screen right there where the little girl is sitting, and it's got a delay on it. And then you can come over here and look in the TV screen that's projected in there. How you're interacting from that green screen and being incorporated right into the stories that right uh, might the story. be up there. So, yeah, and we would call that a theme chosen space. Um, having Spectrum Brain Lab be just integrated into it, just another service point in the library is definitely an opportunity there um, that we would want to explore in the programming phase. And then making sure that Children's <coughs> Museum, even if it does have its own space, there's still the opportunity to do programming and have a display or some interactive piece within the children's space to engage them and pull them into the museum if it's not fully integrated. All of these operational modes we'll explore with you to develop which one is going to function right for you. And then the indoor-outdoor learning. What a great opportunity in this environment, spring, summer, fall, to be able to pull the indoors outdoor. And in the, out, the wintertime, to bring the views in. I mean, the site has really got so much potential. And looking forward to developing that with you by leveraging that indoor space with some outdoor space. On the second floor is where we're looking at create, is how we kind of uh, summarize what we put in the collab technology, 
your web alley type spaces, the maker space would be here, as well as your Montana collection potentially could be located on this create floor. Some of the ideas that we have um, is creating this collab space, which is social, it's academic, it's business, it's community, it's really kind of this mixing chamber type of space. And performances could happen here on a program opportunity. They don't necessarily have to be in a program room. Maybe you've rearranged the furniture and set up for a lunchtime performance, a book reading, or something like that. The group study rooms in Scotts Valley are shown here on the bottom. Some of the most popular spaces in libraries right now um, are really critical. Um, interesting in Scotts Valley, there's actually a, another room that you can't see here that was supposed to be two additional So it's actually, um, yeah, these group study rooms here, this little um, mm -hmm. ones with the orange wall, we had planned three of them. And in working with the uh, client group and the community group, there was a group that really needed, uh, it was rambunctious and needed to be sound isolated. And you're all thinking teams, right? It's the knitting circle. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, we learned a long time ago, you don't argue with people with needles in their hands. <laughs> so we combined two of the rooms into one. Right. Um, over on the right side is two spaces in the Walnut Creek Library. The bottom one, they had a lot of small businesses stay at home in Walnut Creek. So that's a business center. And it's to support the small businesses. It has uh, work rooms, conference rooms adjacent to it, as well as a printing space. And then the top room is kind of what was called the boardroom. And it actually is, somebody asked earlier, well, is that space free? And all the other spaces, the group study spaces are free. Signing up for the community meeting room and the boardroom here is a small charge for the community. And so deciding how you're going to operate what's free, what's pay, what's the right balance, and where's revenue opportunities that make sense and where they don't make sense is definitely going to be part of the discussion early on. And then the maker space. And Honor and Jim and the rest of the staff here has done an amazing job of positioning this library for the future, even within the walls it currently has. And so given the opportunity to design spaces ideally for this to be able to promote maker spaces, jewelry, technology, robotics, all of these things is really exciting. Studio laboratories, I mean, it can be as unique as butchering classes in the library. I think there's a place in Johnson County, um, David is working in Johnson County right now, and they were talking about having Butchering classes in the library. So Kansas farm uh, area too. So here you could have uh, for hunters how to dress your your. Uh, or the artist, you know, artist community in Missoula is huge. The opportunity to have visiting artists come in and do different classes, really creating this unique space that does evolve and change in certain spaces is really something we're looking forward to. The MCAT, of course, can't leave them out, and so putting in a media lab that can be shared by students, used by the community, um, and MCAT as well. Not quite understanding exactly what those relationships are, but understanding those potential to develop them and all make them unique aspects of this project. As we look at the learn, this is our third floor. What we all think when we think of going up three floors on this site is amazing views. And so we put kind of the opportunity to learn, next slide please, um, the great reading room in Santa Clara is a good example of how you can still integrate the indoors, outdoors, upstairs. Next slide is creating things like fireplaces, you know, just definitely create the sense of a community living room, a space where you can sit down, enjoy the book that you found on the uh, shelf or to download your new digital book, um, really a space that you want to spend some time in. I, if I could just interject, I thought it was extremely interesting and always a tour of building with people who do who have a deep knowledge in libraries. And one of the first things that David says is, well, we've lost our great reading room because as the uses of library and the library has grown, those spaces have been squinched down. And I realized, yeah, that's right. There's, there's no large space to sit down and, and cozy up with a book anymore because this building is bulging at the seams. And something that, as a library user and as an architect, I should have noticed was missing. I didn't notice it until he walked in and in 30 seconds, he's like, wow, if, you know, we've, we've eaten our great reading room with expansion. Uh, and I think it would be wonderful to get it back. Definitely. We will. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next, 
This is the next slide. Oh. All right. Um, and again, that opportunity to create indoor outdoor that's at the entry here in Mitchell Park, which I personally always love to purchase, where you can sit and watch things going. If this was looking over Main Street or if it was headed towards Front Street with the river out there, just real great opportunities to create spaces that aren't just inside but outside the library as well. We want to pause here for just a second because we are going through a lot of stuff, and I know. If you're like me, sometimes you have a question and don't have a chance to interject. So, does anybody have anything that they'd like to ask in just a little pause session? Yes. What about staff spaces? I was interviewing some staff at the Seattle Library and they said, you know, our staff space is just this utilitarian thing and we're hot stuck back in the back and I'm like, we don't want that! We want them to be nice. So, do you have any like examples or things you've done for staff? We have excellent examples and I definitely have some on my laptop. I don't know if we've integrated into the presentation because our focus was more on the public spaces. Um, we can definitely give you those, but I would say in Walnut Creek, the daylighting, having good, efficient, um, ergonomic, and comfortable environments for staff is really critical. Um, one of the things staff will always appreciate from our projects is the efficiencies. So being able to have even elevators that have doors that open up directly to the staff room and they can take the collection upstairs when you have multi-layer floors is key because that moving of the collection, how the material flows through the building is just really critical. Um, and you definitely have to work with the library specifically to develop that operational model for them because every library does it differently. And where they take the breaks and maybe someplace exactly. that's Exactly, nice. definitely, absolutely. So um, hopefully we'll be able to, you should definitely go on tours of libraries uh, with whichever architect you select, see their library, see other ones, definitely go behind the scenes and see the staff uh, space. We're very proud of the staff spaces that we do. The library world uh, is a very small world and we, uh, that every librarians all talk to each other and we have been very good students of uh, our uh, library educators in terms of making sure we understand how uh, the stresses uh, it takes to work with the public all day so they need that downtime but it takes to collaborate and practice and rehearse a great story time program to create things for uh, uh, children's displays and uh, programs so uh, we really uh, think very much uh, from the functional aspects of it and what's behind the scenes in addition to the public side as well. Other questions? Frank? Jeff, you described your experience with design build, but what about from the library's perspective? What about our, what should we be doing to make the project successful in terms of management? How do you see that happening as a civil project? Civic project? Really big question, and, and one that I think starts with a conversation about uh, project delivery methods. Uh, People, are you going to have a CM involved, a construction manager, a third party construction manager, or not? Um, what's the current uh, environment from a construction perspective? When we were opening bids in 2010, that conversation will be completely different than it's going to be in the next year. Um, and I think uh, from CTA's perspective, uh, everybody probably, every project manager like me probably has his or her favorite delivery method that they personally prefer. For, prefer. But CTA is extremely comfortable de delivering projects under any of those methodologies. Um, and I don't think we come to the table, I honestly don't think we come to the table with a prescribed opinion. We're going we're gonna to listen and, and then put the options. A lot of this stuff is Greek, too, to the people on the owner side making the decisions. We will sit down and work through it in depth. It's great to have someone like Frank involved who understands these issues. Um, and you'll make the selection. And we're happy to work with whatever model comes out of that process. And there are pros and cons. Pros and cons of every different process. And, and you know, uh, I think that one will percolate to the top as the ideal. Okay, so I'm going to push you a little bit more. What, what have you seen work the best? I understand you might go. I'll give you it. What, so what have you seen work the best? Construction, hiring a third party construction manager and, and delivering a project under some sort of a design build contract are two. I'm going to say hip in the last 10 or 15 years methodologies versus the old traditional bid it to five contractors and deliver the project the traditional way. Um, the construction manager, uh, having a third party construction manager to babysit the owner and the architect design team and the builder is 
there's not a bad way to go. There's an added expense that's significant. And right now, we have a staffing issue with qualified CMs. And it all comes down to that firm or that person and whether they're good. That, that team methodology can work really well, but you're paying a lot of money that, to that construction manager, and they better be really darn good. And there aren't that many in our region. But right now, they are all completely buried. And that would have to be a real conversation with them about, hey, are you interested in running this library project? Can you? How many millions of dollars do you have under your belt right now? Because to do their job well, it's got to be darn near full time on a project like this. Design build methodology, for those of you who don't know, that's where uh, essentially the design engineering team works underneath the umbrella of the builder. Um, and uh, again, we have an entire design build collaborative company that CTA formed, uh, mainly for southwestern projects out of our Austin office. I think last year they delivered $100 million of built product. Um, works great. It comes down to the team, and, the and in this one it comes down to the experience level delivering projects that way of the general contractor. So you want to ask really hard questions of your general contractor, uh, have you worked this way before, and of your architecture team, um, and let's see the projects that you've delivered, and how did they come in on budget, and how did they come in on quality. Um, we can see you with the pros and cons and the right questions to ask for every one of those methodologies. And I do believe that as we move forward through that phase one, one of them will, one of them will come to the forefront as the ideal for you guys. Not for us, but this for you. Next year is the perfect time period in which to really dig deep into that question and figure out what's the right way to get this project. Other questions? OK, we're going to talk a little bit about site. Um, I always tell clients, they always ask, well, have you designed this in your head yet? And for me, uh, I think all of us, you can't really design as an architect until you know what piece of land you're putting something on, and, and in what community in this case. Um, in this case, I've been working on the opposite end of downtown for about two and a half years on the Fox Theater site. And I find myself talking to uh, the people that we presented those concepts to over and over. I keep saying, this is going to be the half of an opportunity for downtown Missoula to grow up. This is Missoula for the next 50 years. And the other half of that equation is this library project. Um, we are creating with this library project a, a, a bookend for the new downtown Missoula. We don't have an east-west termination of Missoula right now that kind of just dies down, where we have this incredible north-south uh, sense of community in downtown Missoula. But we're about to create that. And this project is extremely exciting contextually because of that. If we zoom in a little bit more and, and talk a little more uh, neighborhood specific, that's right. Okay. Yeah. We're already thinking ahead because this neighborhood's about to change, library or no library. We're going to have a, by the time this library project is complete, we're going to have a new neighbor here with this uh, new student housing project that we are working on with Farron Group and another architecture firm out of Texas. And so when we walk out after this interview and look to the south, it's a different world. And then if you lay on that the downtown master planning, the change of street traffic direction, and then this uh, somewhat audacious and wonderful concept of a green belt to the river, wow. And that all is going to add to this, this uh, book ending of downtown. But it's also something that needs to be thought about right now. Because this, is, you know, this may not happen anytime soon because there's private property involved, but this is happening tomorrow, essentially. Um, Another thing to look at, next slide, that we've started to talk about is the almighty P. Um, <laughs> as much as architects hate it, uh, it is the thousand pound tail that wags projects, uh, the dogs of the projects. Parking is the most important project uh, issue on many people's minds for this project and many other projects. Things to think about. We don't have solutions today. Things to think about. We are in downtown uh, Missoula. We have a downtown parking district. We have a community agreed need to deliver solutions for parking as a community. We will explore that deeply. We'll explore near off-site options. We'll explore expansion of parking immediately around the building. These are all off-site options. And obviously, we'll uh, explore on-site parking. Uh, if we reuse the building, can we dig under and add parking? Can we stack parking? We'll look at cost for all of those different options. Um, and another major issue, you know, this is covered with peas. Uh, because we have this functional need, but we also have this uh, almost spiritual need to enter this building. And one of the questions is, what's, what, what's our front door? Uh, the solutions we showed you early uh, solve that by having a front door on both front and main and having this thorough, thoroughfare 
in within the library. That's only one of a potential solution. We'll put options in front of you, get your reaction, look at the pros and cons, and arrive at a, a great solution. Next slide. Uh, last thing I want to mention really quickly is this issue that has been broached of uh, reusing existing building. Three basic options. To be we just are, is reuse yeah. still on the table with the trustees? Are you we're still evaluating uh, new versus reuse? Okay. I didn't think we were. But I didn't I'm think not we were either. Okay, so then you guys went to all new. Was where you were heading? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that might be set. I think we talked about like flipping. <laughs> this would be parking, and that would be the building. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's more like the staging uh, phasing aspects, as I was talking to Christine earlier, so that's why I was uh, uh, wondering if we could um, move forward towards the, the new aspect. Which is fantastic. So uh, I can skip <laughs> two-thirds of what I was just about to say and skip straight to one thing that's going to be really critical that we analyze in this phase one, which is um, how are we going to do this thing phasing-wise? You have a library to operate. You have people coming into the building. Are we really going to build a multi-million dollar project immediately next to an, an operating building? Completely possible. Uh, completely doable. We do it all the time on projects. It, there are pros and cons. There are costs associated. One of the thoughts is, let's pick the whole building up and move it and, and clean this side up for the general contractor, which saves on money on the general contracting side. Can we rent um, the old drugstore space across the street from Trempers, for example, a low cost, big empty space that we can move the library to? That may not be the solution, but we're going to look at it. We're going to put it in front of you, and we're going to look at it next slide with all the pros and cons operationally, but also dollars-wise. Both of our firms have uh, in-house deep expertise at cost estimating. When we put cost estimating in front of you as you make these decisions, it won't just be the hard construction cost. It's going to include things like the cost of financing. It's going to include things like uh, what we love and we call FF and E, which is soft goods, furniture, window coverings. Uh, but staff time to move things all of that in a comprehensive cost analysis because we know dollars are going to be part of this decision making process every step of the way. Can I ask a question? Yeah. When I go to an expert, you know, I want them to tell me what they think is the best thing, even though I'm a mission to see. We use come and say there's this, this, and this. We really think this would work, but let us make the decision. Instead of saying, well, you know, like that kind of method doctors have, well, you could do this or this or this, and I'm not going to tell you. Are you going to come and say, this is what we think is the best from an architectural That's standpoint? That's an incredibly good question. And what I always find myself saying to clients is, our job is to listen deeply, which I've said about 100 times, to all of your needs. And it's going to be a mishmash. To us, it's not a mishmash. Our job is very quickly to distill that into good, beautiful solutions that work for your needs. Um, we will present those to you. And we will be driven by your your desires. Some of them may not be our first choice. It may be our second or third choice. But if it's a bad idea, if we think there's a profound flaw in something, we will speak up and say, we'll go this way, but we think this is a mistake and here's why. But Can you I, tell us what your first choice is? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. absolutely. Yeah. But we also... Both if our idea is bad and what your first choice our, our either Both of our firms, I would say, are low ego and that we're not going to walk in and say, here's the library of your dreams. See you later. Uh, this and is your solution. Twist your arm for it until we're and It's a delicate yeah. balance, but yeah, we definitely will but speak it's, up. it's the process too. It's about developing informed information so you can make those informed decisions. We'll develop evaluation criteria for you based on your project goals. We'll develop the solutions for you. We'll help you evaluate those solutions and come up with a defensible recommendation that is the best meet of all of the criteria. And let's uh, segue and show you that we're not shy to share our opinions too. Well, we didn't know where you were on the reuse versus new. And so we were trying to show you, when we, so we did the college try on reuse. That's what's illustrated here and showing how we work. So just in a couple of weeks of, of prep time, uh, we can go and make the digital model that you saw from the site. We can still modify it. So you recognize this is your this existing building and then we <laughs> modified it and said, well, we actually think you can make a good fix to uh, this building and transform it. We don't, I don't think that's the best way to go. I guess I think you're going to, this existing building uh, will end up with more force than you need. It will still be hard to adjust. You'll be making, putting so much investment into the existing part uh, to transform it. And with the uh, impacts of uh, phasing that Jeff was talking about, uh, is that the best alternative? Probably not. 
but uh, we, in Dayton, Ohio, where we're 125,000 square foot above ground, two levels of underbuilding parking. Two, it was part of their bond election language. They pulled it, and reusing the building was uh, important to the public. And so they chose that. It's $187 million to redo uh, 17 <laughs> libraries. We're designing them all. Uh, they, uh, so that was an important decision. We have a fantastic library. It's not a compromise in that good bones. Their, their bones were better than this one. So uh, moving on <laughs> to the... Well, no, the, I hope I'm not insulting anyone. <laughs> tell me... Uh, so then uh, that last one we're talking about, uh, one of the ideas was to have something that was unique and a landmark. Uh, and I'm going to sort of pass out uh, some little models. This was a, a, a 3D printed one. We wish we could have had time to print it in your library here. Uh, some of the next ones would be, and this will be one that will show up in this guy, and then you can just weave it back and forth. But so the last one we were saying, how do you transform this building, was to do one technique uh, that's really sort of aspirational to have what we call butterfly roof, or one that sort of rises up and frames the views of the mountains. And so if we could do whole floors, uh, we have that here. And then, uh, by having a larger floor plate, it gives you the opportunity of creating a central atrium to have that intuitive wayfinding, how to find where's the collaboration floor and brand you at the bottom and get into the portals of the children's area. Next slide, please. Um, and then playing with different shapes and forms that we're not going to just have one sketch and I'm going to do it, my team's going to do it. We're going to have all good ideas, and then from anyone else, we'll go and see where the best idea comes from. And you can do uh, some geometries that, like, you know, architects like straight lines and things, but here, this was a fun idea. We had one straight line like here and the other one here. And if you stretch fabric between, it creates a nice curve. If you remember that first Walnut Creek, pretty reading room had that sinuous ceiling. We like the yin and the yang. Uh, aspect of it. It makes it a warm place. And then another idea looking for inspiration. Uh, we have lots of different ideas uh, with you and we can get uh, community input on these. Is uh, Like we said, well, what is one of the uh, archetypal uh, northwestern building types? The Mountain Lodge, the uh, uh, Faithful Inn or other place. So you reinterpret it in a modern way. You don't have to do it uh, just in the old-fashioned way and do it on a civic scale. And so here we have one that we're of a a building can adjust uh, its height and shape to fit into the neighborhood, but still open and reflect uh, the neighborhood. And so I said, well, we're not going to just uh, come and sell you with one idea. Next slide, please. Uh, is that on the one side of the kiosk, if you hadn't done it, we have the design values, and we get not just what should be in the library, but how should it reflect the community. The next slide, too. And we zoom in, and we already were hearing uh, here that like, warm and cozy or having to be invited. Is this library inviting now? So, is it warm now? <laughs> and so hopefully you see in these images, people come and say, oh, I love it. I love the colors. I love the warmth and the wood, the material, stone reflecting. And each product reflects its location that you have. This isn't going to be like Dayton, Ohio. It's not going to be like Houston, Texas. It's not going to be like San Francisco. It's going to be uniquely uh, fitting uh, uh, here. So next slide. And so we have these little white models, these computer sketches that we've done. So well, how... But I still don't get it. I don't see it. It's too, I don't think three-dimensional like an architect, or I don't understand these models. It's just snow again, or spring. Why is everything white and such? So we try to take that same model and we can uh, render uh, slides with a genuine watercolor brush, and we can actually, this is still in the model, and we put it through where you can see the warmth of stones and wooden materials and transparency, and start getting, this was the original butterfly adapted one. And so we can whip out these uh, pretty quickly. Next slide, please. And so then they uh, reinterpreted uh, Mountain Lodge, uh, one with a lot of transparency, inviting you in from every aspect of the floor, the scale stepping down to the neighborhood, getting a sense of co-branding opportunities uh, for each of your partners uh, in the library. We'll do these three. We'll do another ten. I can guarantee you that this won't do what we'll be building, uh, but uh, you will get your feedback on these inspirations for so that's on the outside. So many people think they're architects think about the outside. We actually design from the inside out on the butterfly scheme. Uh, we see opportunities of combining modern with opportunities to display historic artifacts and art. And the next slide. And so in the uh, Mountain Lodge reinterpreted, uh, we're actually taking this as a view of Mount Sentinel. It feels in the model, it looks a little foreshortened. It's a little further away. Uh, but it still uh, is there. We've actually started uh, saying, hey, well, stack tops, you want them to be lower so you can access them. They don't have to be up to the, uh, up to the ceiling. They could actually reflect the opportunities in the uh, incorporating uh, public art. We do on all of our projects working with artists and 
incorporating the architecture. Just imagine sitting at these tables uh, to the north of the south of the roof terrace there. Uh, has this any resonance, any of these things resonate with any of you? Does this sound like it could be fun uh, for you guys? Do you think the community would like it? Any big ideas were missing or shouldn't have uh, uh, missed in this presentation? This is another point of interaction. Yeah. Yeah. The orientation of the roof uh, wouldn't prohibit it, but it wouldn't be optimum for solar, would it? Okay. So, the roof's slanting uh, to the south. Okay, so west. for solar power collection, so the uh, that is an excellent point. And maybe uh, uh, I don't have it on this. Uh, Dawn's computer is working better than mine today, so it's on hers, but I had this model. <coughs> and in Dayton, as we were doing, we had two different options there, and one had a real prominent corner that they really wanted to relate to as a gateway to downtown. And they said, well, I like this, but this other option is really better. And so we were able to stretch it and make it so I could actually spin this model uh, around. It was designed for solar orientation to windows at the moment. So you had more light. The windows enough for, but not for Right. Mm -hmm. So it's a great point. I was thinking about uh, Medford, City of Medford Library, the main library. And my aunt hates it. It's very pretentious. You go into this huge staircase with these huge columns, and it's all marble. And it would be nice to be able to see that and say, this is not fit. You know, it's just is something that looks like it belongs in, I don't know, London or something. But that's, I like the idea of being able to just kind of like look at stuff and tweet things and say, now, now, yeah. Or maybe right. that way. Right. You need a hang glider coming out. <laughs> there you go. We told him that thing is that. You see that a kayaker shooting the rapid tire here. Yeah, the, the, two of the keys contextually that this, I think, my opinion, uh, this library wants to evoke are the, the casual and formality and, and uh, community nature of this town that we all cherish. And also the interaction that most everybody has with the outdoors here. It's a unique, we're downtown in this really incredible urban space, but also surrounded by this incredible natural beauty. And this site has one foot in each of those. And I think this building wants to reflect that, reflect the combination of those two things and the informality. You know, we're not a, 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 a marble staircase, pedimented kind of a library town. We're a first Friday, there's an art show going on the, on the you know, this, the entry that you kind of spill into. With your dog. With your dog. <laughs> yeah, I'll talk about that later. <laughs> I was liking it. I liked how Randy talked about his children's book he did in Honor. I love that you put architecture books out in the back for the public. And one of them, and David McCauley, oh, you all of you architects all grew up with David McCauley books. Do you know them? Jim, can you hold them up for others uh, in the back there? So one of them was about the building of a cathedral, and others about the building of a of a, that's a cathedral, and there's another one back there. So uh, if you think about your current art museum, that's the old Carnegie uh, Library, and that was the temple of its day. In the old day, it was, the knowledge was pristine, and you would find the temple stairs, and you would count out to the librarians who were going to pitch your <laughs> And uh, that's uh, north, like the opposite of you know, that type of librarian. And so we have an opportunity to create the next generation of what the civic icon should be. It says, what is this place of discovery for children, of collaboration and creativity and reading and learning? Like that's the, those are going to be the, the drivers of the creative form that sort of represents that instead of uh, something else. Other thoughts, sir? So uh, one of the questions that you shared with us is when do you get to see the models? Well, there are a couple of them going around uh, here. And those are really fun uh, to make. Uh, Again, it looks like it snowed on it, or it's a little chess piece uh, out there. Monopoly, Monopoly piece. library. <laughs> so uh, here's one for the Walnut Creek Library to help in their capital campaign. And it's about the size of half of one of these tables here. And so you can really get your nose up into it and get a sense of it. And that really helps bring it to life because so many people can't uh, visualize uh, that. And uh, then we'll talk and about And so I, I think just from the model to the campaign and how we are here to support the project in its entirety. Strategically partnering with you to get this project funded, designed, and built. And so that a big part of that is going to be the community information campaign. It's going to be the funding of the project. It's going to be developing uh, 
donors, it's going to be developing the support from the community, um, and all of these exhibits that we're showing you, all of our tools, all of our boards, all of our kiosks, are tools to be leveraged throughout this for that. And just for some of the projects that we've been showing you, I've kind of put together a couple of packets of materials that we could use during them to help support library foundations, to help support the community information campaign, and to reach out to the community. Um, this exhibit here for the Lesher Foundation, a million dollar donor for Walnut Creek. Prior to the foundation sitting down, meeting with them, asking for that million dollar donation, we helped develop the graphics, work with them. So when they went to meet with them, they had something to show. They could show a fly-through model to Becky Morgan for her million dollar donation of the kids' place in Mitchell Park. When we are developing our exhibits to go out to the community, we want to see what your polling results were. We want to hear what resonated on the polls. We want to know what messages we should be highlighting. What And it also helps us inform in the building program, right? If this is what the community is voting for, we should be listening to this. And we should be paying attention and making sure that we're accommodating these needs in the library. And so being this strategic partner um, throughout the project, we all of these projects we've shown you have had either local funding challenges, local funding measures, and all of them have had public-private partnerships. And so that's proven really key. And I think that partnership does go beyond a professional partnership. Donating our time, doing the yard signs, doing the dinner with the Googlers to get their million dollar donation. You know, whatever it takes, we are here to be there by your side to make sure it happens. Yeah, that's an important point as your community outreach person through this team is that I'm engaged in that every day in business development of the community and our leaders and events and things like that. So I have a pulse of what's going on and trying to so I can bring that feedback when these technically skilled people are designing and looking at things and working with you on how a technical level too, that I can bring back some of these things. So by your side the next two years, you know, at events, Saturday morning, wherever it may be, Friday morning, Friday, first Friday, getting that feedback and bringing it back to the team. Okay, so with that, I think we're slightly over our hour goal. Sorry about that. But um, we would love to have questions, answer questions. And That's we can zoom in on anything you see here. You're actually scheduled to go till 2.15 um, in terms of your formal presentation. So if you'd like have anything more to say before you open it up to general questions. Could we reserve just three minutes at the end of that leftover minutes? But no, we, we were, an hour and 15 sounded a little daunting be sitting there and not up the opportunity to talk with us. So. We would say that we have not practiced. <laughs> <laughs> no, we would not say that. First of all, thank you for being here. Second, uh, can you give us some examples of how you've designed libraries to be flexible and adaptable? Absolutely. Um, so I think if we look at Mitchell Park is one, I don't know if we can go to those images, Cassie, for the Mitchell Park Library data to help you navigate there. Um, so the Mitchell Park Library is one that has flexible walls that open up and move, rooms are divisible, they can be set up a technology lab seamlessly because in the technology closet we have the laptop computers on our docking stations, that there's a place to store the 3D printer, power and data throughout the floor that is totally adaptable um, within the room. They can set up the makerspace in that. They did not want a dedicated makerspace, but they can set it up in about 25 minutes. Um, it can be your standard classroom. It can be double-sided or single-sided as well. Um, I think the Walnut Creek one um, that David showed you is probably one. And what was fabulous at Mitchell Park, just how we designed this, and this is something I'm sure Honora would jump on during finals week in December. They kept the building open on the studying floor for the teens. They were allowed to stand there till midnight, order pizza, have their own study groups. Every night during finals week. The teens had some place to go besides your living room, their friend's living room, or their bedroom to study and do their group projects like they did. <laughs> Walnut Creek is amazing. It actually has five operational modes. It can have just the program meeting rooms can divide off. If you zoom back out, there's like a mall gate that's hidden up there in the ceiling that comes down and shuts off right at that location. 
it's right off on this side of that um, opening in the floor. And so you can go directly up to the community meeting space, the conference room, the technology lab, independent use of that. As a market space that operates independently, as well as the garage supports all of the downtown merchants and was designed with parking fees. <coughs> and that way, when the library is closed, the garage works independently as well. And a lot of people will say they, oh, we can make it flexible and such, but if any part that operates independently needs access to restrooms, has to have independent uh, power and electricity and security uh, systems there, has to have safe exiting, the L has to be fully accessible. So it's a real uh, puzzle to how to work out those pieces, and we've done this uh, for over a decade on a variety of projects. And just for flexibility, too, in case you could zoom into that uh, little mobile uh, desk and perch uh, here. So there are wheels under the desk, so at different times of day, uh, there are different where the sort of the hot spots of where uh, the reference library. desk can move over to the team space was directly adjacent to it and it also moves up and down for ergonomics because Sensitive. we want to make sure we take care of our staff and make it adjustable for them. From a technical perspective too, there's the flexibility of you know uh, cat cat six, cat seven, what's gonna be the next cat nine cabling that I know this building has struggled with. Um, it would be a disservice not to deliver a project with uh, replaceable cable trays running everywhere so that those swap outs that are inevitable can happen without tearing the building up. There are even, uh, we talked about this yesterday, examples of projects with, um, you know, with IT floors essentially where you can uh, access an entire raceway. Well, so these, these floors are all raised floors. Actually, Mitchell Park has raised floor, Walnut Creek has raised floor, Santa Clara has raised floor. So power and data is all accessible under the floor. And that's actually where the heating and cooling comes. So we are heating and cooling just the people spaces. It's not having to come down from that high volume. And that flexibility is immense because we're all using wireless now, but that power we haven't figured out. Right. So you can see these little uh, uh, registers on the floor uh, there. And so if you haven't experienced a library or a, a public building with it, you have these high ceilings, the old fashioned uh, air conditioning and heating is coming from the ceiling, so you're going to have to push one of those temperatures through all the rest of the air uh, by it's very inefficient. You have it coming up here. We've even put them in uh, some uh, program rooms and children's story time, and the little kids like to sit there. Because <laughs> yeah. it's very slow, because here they have to blow hard, and the floor is just very gentle uh, temperature, and it's very yeah. energy efficient. It's about 10 to 15 percent less uh, energy heating, cooling loads needed when you deliver through the floor. It's something we've done a lot of. Not every project does it make sense for. And when we talk about budgets and strategies, it's investing in how much do you want right now and how much do you want to invest for the 100 years. The flexibility, the trays that said the under four uh, aspects are ones that are investments that will allow you to keep on evolving over time uh, to stay relevant to your community. And I think we would work very hard with you and advocate uh, to get that right balance so you have a really robust and flexible architecture. Great. Um, you mentioned that you asked um, some kids at like schools and in mm -hmm. the community. Would you think that maybe you could like ask middle schoolers and high schoolers more specifically to see what they wanted in their space and just asking everybody what would be good in this space? But oh, actually, yes, this now we do need to go to the Mitchell Park um, space. So yes, um, engagement in the design process is taken throughout the project. And in the Mitchell Park Library Community Center, both the teen space and the recreation center, the community center and the library, we did charrettes with a teen group of about 85 folks. So early on in the programming services, we got their input on what activities, what programs they wanted to do there. When it came to space planning, I think one of the outreach photos um, actually shows us at the teen charrette where we're holding up their designs. We come with game boards, with images, ideas that they can put in. They can help design the space. Um, this space here, we have technology gaming right here where this little boy is behind that. We have active gaming behind that. There's an informal performance space on the left of that. In the back is a technology bar, which also is their snack bar after school. Then there's collaborative and social spaces here. This all, all these functions in this room came from the team Charette. They also, we took the furniture, we toured it through the schools. They were um, pre-selected options that they had. 
and fabric selection colors they were also able to choose and weigh in on. They got to sit in the chairs, they got to sit on the couches. They own this space. <laughs> and it's really amazing. On opening day, you go in there, and it's like, um, you know, it's been your baby for the two years it's being built. On opening day, it's like that child ran away from you. <laughs> because those kids own the space. And they all, I mean, they come back and they say, oh, these are the chairs we picked. It is very exciting. So, yes, absolutely. And the, in the Car Carnegie era of libraries, all the chairs were on rows. It was like when we were seven. Uh, grandparents went to school, so they were, the, they were the, I think the desks were bolted to the floor here. And so now it's about people being able to collaborate in ones, twos, fours, tens, move their furniture around. Uh, this public art installation in the teen area uh, here has uh, these different panels that have two sides, and the teens can just rearrange it today and flip them around and make different patterns by the artists are very sophisticated on how. Uh, pieces of the patterns connect when they're in this order, but you flip it around. And, and the back side, they actually get to put their own artwork on. Right. And so it's less about uh, us saying this is how you should use the library and creating an opportunity for people to come in and make it. Uh, who has a uh, I library, my library button? Any people have those? So that's about the uh, sort of uh, future theme about uh, using the uh, like iPhone, internet, uh, those things. And it's my library. It's my experience for it. So much of the business world and all the uh, enterprises we interact with are not me doing it their way, but they're all trying to uh, do customer service about what works for me and how I do it. Your library is already uh, very forward uh, thinking in that building architecture to support that. Yeah, and even the outreach kiosk. I mean, we design Instagram more flavored exhibits where we go at lunchtime to the high school or the middle school and actually take the opportunity to get three or four hundred kids to give us the input. Can you describe your experience with the 2030 initiative, and is that something we should even be concerned about? So uh, this is the, well, <laughs> this is the sort of the uh, living building net zero uh, strategy. So we have. Uh, uh, we live in a challenging time. I like that we're talking about 100-year buildings here. Uh, and the, we feel very fortunate to uh, have clients who make these uh, requests to be thinking really long term. And so that means uh, we uh, our first few net zero projects, that means taking uh, your generating power, or uh, you can talk about uh, Jeff, some of the great strategies we have on our site. Um, here, uh, making a building that's durable and maintainable is very much a part of that as well. I like the question about their solar orientation and opportunities to uh, generate that. We did the San Jose Environmental Innovation Center, which was uh, received uh, big stimulus funds, its demonstration of each type of uh, wind generation, uh, solar, uh, hydronic, hot water, uh, heating, photovoltaic uh, power. It's got a green tech incubator in it. So looking to uh, maximize all those opportunities, we love the opportunity. And Mitchell Park is LEED Platinum, and so I think one of the things that is going to be most important as we're going through the belt and the cost model and making these decisions is that we look at life cycle costs with you. We come with the information so you can make those important decisions. It's really not our decision to say we want a net zero energy building, right? <laughs> because those things cost money and they're investments and there's going to be trade-offs. And so bringing the information so you understand what the trade-offs are and so we can pick the right solution for you is critical. Um, we've pretty much done the whole gamut of project types in terms of energy systems. Um, the Palo Alto Rinconada Library has the um, ground source uh, geothermal. Uh, Mitchell Park Library has the night sky radiant cooling. Um, so there's all kinds of opportunities to explore different systems, and we'll be working with CTA and their engineers to make those selections. So a, a very brief comment about the world of sustainable architecture in the last 10 years. We're talking right now in casual terms about 10 technology and building goals 10 years ago that I would have told my clients, this just ain't going to happen for 50 years. The USGBC and the LEED have driven and consumers, all of us. Building Council. Uh, I'm sorry, the U.S. Green Building Council, which administers the LEED program, has led a wave forward in building technology and energy efficiency that has been profound. 
And as a matter of fact, it was so fast, building codes have caught up to lead so fast that the USGBC and LEED got caught behind the, the front of the wave. Because uh, when 10 years ago, a LEED building was incredibly unique. Now, we're cranking them out like hotcakes. It's almost assumed that most of our buildings are going to be at least at some level of LEED. So looking forward to these initiatives, um, the passive initiatives, the net zero initiatives, the 2030 initiatives, uh, five years ago, I would have said, boy, these are just kind of pie-in-the-sky goals. And, uh, and that's working for a firm that has a proprietary relationship, a preferred provider relationship with USGBC in doing these things. Um, now today, I can sit here and tell you, these net zero buildings are being constructed all over the nation. This isn't pie-in-the-sky. Uh, we can start looking at those benchmarks and where you want to land. There are cost implications. Um, and working through. There are some no-brainers, too. There are a ground source heating and cooling. First Interstate Bank Tower uh, would have done that with no LEED certification. From when you look at the economics of that very green heating and cooling system, it just makes sense. Because we have such a beautiful aquifer about 10 feet below us here, it's a no-brainer for this building as well. So we'll check all those off the list. We have, um, we have that list, and we'll share it with you. And then we'll get into the ones that actually do have economic impacts. And, and we'll land on where you want to be. Do you have a solar, a solar contractor you work with? Mm -hmm. we, we actually, so uh, Alan Bronick is a senior partner in the Missoula office. He's also one of the smartest electrical engineers I've ever worked with. He has done hydro plants and solar plants around the nation. Yellowstone Park, he's just finishing one. Um, he teams up with a solar expert named Dan Brambor, um, who actually used to be an employee of mine. He's a 40-year solar expert. and. Uh, Oftentimes, Alan will pull Dan in on a project. Dan does not work for CTA, the solar, he owns his own business. But when it's a really intense solar design, a really big one, like the one we just did in the Yellowstone, he'll pull Dan in with him. So that one-two punch is about the best there is. So I'm going to just add on to this, because for the library's perspective in the educational world, what we did at Mitchell Park was we actually developed ecoglyphs. And so across the site, we kind of label them ecoglyphs. We have these emblems that highlight different opportunities on the site that we've taken advantage of done green strategies. So where we have the parking lot and we have our virus well, there is a little ecoglyph there. There's an ecoglyph on the night sky radiant cooling water tower. There's an ecoglyph um, where you can see the green roof on the other buildings. And then we have these informational panels at four locations in the building where you can go and you can decipher and it has a whole write-up of what the green strategies were. So it's really an educational opportunity and it's also a gaming opportunity because when the kids come in, they get a, a worksheet and go find however many ecoglyphs you can find in the building and you can go get a cookie at the cafe. <laughs> you know, and so there's real opportunities to make it unique and fun and not just something that is a little bit more and educational about seems, what you've done. It seems to might help politically too for, in terms of getting a bond issue. Oh yeah, and if you're one of those people who want to donate to something to be able to say that, hey, this was, you know, funded by, it's very cool. Another last comment um, is that our engineering team at, at um, CTA has a preferential relationship with Northwestern Energy. Um, there are rebates and funding sources for some of this. None of them pay 100% of the cost. I wish they did. Um, Northwestern Energy, you can say, all right, I did X, Y, and Z. I did super low energy LED lights, and they'll give you $50 per light. We have a relationship where we actually give them deeper engineering calculations and we can get a higher rebate from them and bring more money to bear for our clients on the job. And we would definitely apply this to this project to help uh, soften the blow of some of these sustainability uh, cost increases. Other questions? Yeah, we're, we're taking on a real fascinating task of integrating children's museum spectrum and, and the library. What's the range of strategies to integrate those programs that you've talked about? We've talked about the full range from having a corner location where you can have independent access and maybe just visual connection from one space to the other, or you're completely integrated into them. 
Um, we work for uh, Houston Library, is one of our clients, and they actually have a children's museum that has a small branch library in it. So that's a little bit of the extreme, right? But I think what we need to do is understanding the programming needs of the Children's Museum and Spectrum, be able to look at it, overlay it on the library, and really understand how they're going to operate, where the opportunities for synergy are, and where the challenges are going to be. And, and that's, I think, is, again, something different about this firm, because David and I are architects. We're not library programmers. But what our firm has done is got a much more in-depth knowledge of how libraries function and could function so we can actually push back on the library and work it together because a lot of times it's hard to know what you haven't experienced, right? But we have all this vast experience. We can say, oh, but they're doing it here even though you haven't done it. Let's go visit and see how it works, right? And, and really get it to be more personal and informed decisions, I guess, is really what Building in this beautiful city and with this great library is very exciting. This particular aspect about these partnerships is one of the things that we think is uh, uh, has the potential of setting new directions nationally, if not internationally, here because uh, the old idea of working in silos and doing everything so independently, the community to the community, we're hitting the whole age spectrum here, and we're working with children, the most important uh, uh, demographic uh, here. So we're very excited uh, ourselves about. Uh, being able to, if we're so fortunate to get to work with you, to uh, develop that, see where it goes with these options, and then uh, uh, and help others who've been trying to do Right? I mean, and who's going to benefit from it the most is the kids. Yeah. The more we can integrate it, the more opportunity we have to make it seamless, even though they're going to operate independently potentially, it's going to be the kids who are going to be the big winners. Other questions? Barbara, how much time do we have? Uh, until quarter three. A quarter three. Okay, so we have uh, some time. So some people who haven't, uh, well, what, we, what we've done effectively in how we work with groups of this size, and this might be similar to what we call the building committee. Uh, we work with building committees a lot. We would typically not have rows, but we would have a big uh, sort of you. We know that the final boss is usually the trustees uh, who are you're charged with having to uh, do the uh, fiduciary responsibility that the community uh, gives you for it with the investments they're making uh, for it, but it's, we try to make it more collaborative. And one of the things that uh, uh, learned many years back is very effective is to sort of go around and get everyone to hear some sort of capsule uh, impressions, what do you think worked and didn't work. And I might suggest, I don't know we have time for the entire audience here, but I know you're trying to use this interactive and hear from them as well, but I might say we work from the sort of uh, backwards forward of the building committee members uh, when we use if that's uh, okay. And to hear, maybe to uh, start with you, uh, uh, Tan, uh, to hear just what were, from this, uh, uh, the things you heard, what resonated most, what seems most uh, exciting to you and what we heard here from this team. Like um, that, um, the building Okay. So I'm asking you to get uh, another uh, member of the uh, team. How about Kristen from the Children's Museum? Sure, I'm looking at the notes here. Okay. Um, I, I really, I, I love the boards. I love the community engagement and the discussion about putting the community partners um, throughout the entire process. That is, is very appealing to me. Um, I loved, I mean, all of the pictures were beautiful and the designs and the the walls that can be pulled down as far as being able to adapt to changes in the future. So. Maybe we can then go correct. Okay, so that way you know if you have to take it, you can pass if you want. Who would you like to hear from I, I've got, I actually have a few questions. I was going to wait. Well, now it's a good time. Yeah. Okay. But we don't get to those of you who were just relieved that you had questions. We'll still come back to you. <laughs> I was just wondering if you guys, do you have any, um, first of all, thank you for all the work you've done. And, um, I saw you on the street. I did. Right? Nice to see you again. <laughs> and um, so welcome. Do you, do you have any heroes in the, in the world of architecture? One hero? Well, Al Peralta was always my Who's that? Al Peralta. You'll know his work when you look it up. You'll recognize him. He is the Personally. genius of the beautiful curve. Just 
you, when you see his architecture, it's breathtaking. And, it's, and it was at a time when everybody, some of my heroes, were into glass and steel, brutal boxes, and um, just a genius architect, one of my favorites. I'm from Norway or Scandinavia. Scandinavia, I don't Scandinavia and so his ethos fits into the uh, um, mountain uh, region so well that we, uh, as well as the name I was thinking of, he's one of my favorites. We have his monographs in our office. But uh, a funny anecdote on that is uh, for a lead gold library we did in Sacramento area, we designed it with these uh, old factory style sawtooth roof with these light registers, which is a, a technique uh, Alto did, but it was a soaring style. And we're trying to figure out what new technology can do all sorts of calculations. But our blading designer and engineer actually studied with Alvaro Alto, and uh, he said, oh, it's just about proportions, and it's a much simpler thing. You don't have to throw it into a computer. Yeah, and a uh, library in Portland area. You know. Have you guys, have you done any, any work that sort of spun off from this uh, in, in his inspiration or anything? Haven't met that community yet. How about, are you open to that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do you have any projects that you're most proud of? And if so, which ones would they be? Oh, well, you're Such asking your us kids. to pick our fa favorite child. <laughs> <laughs> you do that. Sorry. They all are, you know, what's, I think, most rewarding. And, you know, personally, you look at these buildings and, you know, everyone says, oh, Mitchell Park is so, so you know, it's well, so contemporary. Mm -hmm. But it's an Eichler bill. And if you're familiar with an Eichler building, it's in that south part of Palo Alto where there's all Eichlers there. And then the Rinconada Library is another library did, which is a historic library in Palo Alto. Completely different characters. So we did three libraries for Palo Alto, and not one of them looks the same. And they're really unique to that each community, each neighborhood. And, and that's how all of our buildings are. Um, so so if we, if we, so if the board of trustees selects you, I envision you work very closely with the community. Absolutely. Um, what part of being an architect do you like the least? <laughs> <laughs> we all know you love being an architect. <laughs> you know, I had said the same, but Cassie <laughs> said the same this morning. When you love what you do, it's not work. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think the, the most challenges we have, and I don't think there's anything that I personally don't like, there are challenging times, and you have hard decisions to make. And like, you know, you can't plan on the economy skyrocketing, right? But a hard job would be to say, okay, we only budgeted for 5% escalation because that's the average over the last 30 years. We're hitting 7% escalation. We got to regroup, and we got to regroup now. And so, facilitating those hard decisions, you know, is so critical that you do it proactively. But they're never fun. And, and it's critical with every project if, to be a successful architect and to have happy clients. And that's the same thing because we don't advertise on TV. We advertise through having happy clients at the end of a project. It's about, it's really, it sounds simple, but it's about communicating clearly and delivering on the goals for schedule, budget, and quality. Quality is the only one that's a little confusing. By quality, I mean the quality of the building, the quality of the design, all of those design issues smashed into that bucket. But those three buckets, that's it. The, the difficulty in our job becomes, our job is to make sure that we're starting with attainable buckets, and there's a balance between those. You could have this library done in 24 months. You could do it. It would cost an enormous amount of money, and we would slip on the design goals, because that was the driving thing. So our job always is to listen very carefully to our clients, and sometimes the hard part about our job is being the ones to deliver the news that the balance between those three buckets isn't gonna isn't good, and that we're way weighted over here, and that things aren't gonna work well. And I find the key being being very honest about that communication and starting on day one, writing down and defining for everybody what those goals are, and then checking in ad nauseum about those three goals. At the beginning of most of my project monthly meetings with a with a control group of clients is where are we on schedule, where are we on budget, where are we on quality? Have they changed? And they are going to change. There are bad days at the office for every architecture project and every construction project. This is not cranking out iPhones. This is creating an incredible community asset that's a custom product. It's about communicating those three things. And that's where it really are the toughest days for us, where, where we have to, where something shifts, the bond changes, or and we have to readjust and communicate.
Um, how did CT4, CTA, I like that. Like that. Group, <laughs> group 4, and then group 4 finds CTA, how did you, you guys end up together? Because who was that who worked with you guys? I, I, I found these guys. Uh, so uh, Dawn uh, was tracking this uh, project and being a, uh, a uh, NSU uh, alum, and we were always <laughs> looking for these type of uh, good opportunities. We feel so lucky to have uh, work in what better projects? design and libraries. Like mm -hmm. uh, we are so lucky uh, to get these uh, types of projects. And so then we were looking for uh, the right ones that we're not, uh, we look for people who complement our work as we look for teams, we're forming teams as uh, you had said at the beginning, Jeff, like it's in our DNA to collaborate. And so finding, uh, I have lots of good architects, I won't go into anyone specific, but in other communities, I'll tell the anecdotes, they'll be the, the I'm the big ego architect, okay, well, that's not going to be right. Or they're just going to use us to try to pick our brain, but then you're not going to get the right project out of that as well. So someone who really collaborates their, their integrated team is uh, because uh, everything you've said about the market conditions and having, it's, it takes a big team to bring us together, and then it gets very complicated. It looks like a big spider with all these different offices and trying to get everyone synced in schedules and goals and having the uh, compact team and, uh, our work with those thought leaders, but even from the programmers and other consultants too, I'm sure everyone's bringing, we know, we know everybody in the, in the industry and just we've worked with them enough that we can carry that ball in the programming really deliver to you this combined team better. So did group four find CCA? Yes. 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 Called Randy. Yeah. Yes. Called Randy. Yeah. Heavily. Okay. That's good. <laughs> He's <laughs> ready again. Yeah. 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 I think it's a, no, no, it's a special thing for us because Jeff and I, and guess we're here, yeah. and it's our community. And as much as, as Don and, and David are beginning to love our community like we love our community, it's still our community. It rests heavy on our shoulders the CTA um, to bring this monumental project into the world. So I'm wondering why Group 4 called CTA as opposed to the Because we liked the ability from the owner's perspective, ideally, if I was on your side, having an integrated team is the way to go. So were they your first choice, or did you call them? They were our first choice. Yeah. Yeah. Having the integrated team is going to be hugely beneficial from your perspective. Right. I did call Oz because they had done the study, like to see if they were there. I think they were already teamed up, but there was no. Uh, these were the. I, we, we check. I spoke to. I know everybody in town uh, now, and was uh, checking on them. Everyone's very open. You have very nice. Uh, architects, you know, in order to work with all of them, you said it's going to be very difficult to choose amongst all these uh, collaborators. But it's really, uh, 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 we uh, could not be happier with uh, the team. It's important too, to note that I mean, we've talked about this internally. At some point, we get the job, and we all go behind our doors and close the door and go, oh, okay, now what? And one of the first things we did is we set up this huge menu of stuff that we're going to be doing, and we talk about how who's doing this, who's doing that. We've already started to have that discussion in depth. And sometimes you're going to see a team that comes in and says, I want whichever side, the out-of-town guru or the in-town presence. And one of them is going to say, I want 95% of this project. I want to do the design. I want the creative beauty of this to be mine. I want da, 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 da. just give me your expertise and get out of my way. We are talking about, there will not be a, a significant major meeting throughout the entire project, including CA, construction and admin, where we're not both represented. Um, we give you that today, is that we will both be committed through the entire project. And essentially, it looks like a kind of a reverse wedge because of the expertise early on, these guys will be this much of the project, will be this much of the project, and it'll reverse as construction begins because we'll be on the boots on the ground every day, but we'll both be there the entire way. And your last question, who, what about time? I mean, you know, this is a big this is huge. commitment. We're, we're going to so you guys have projects going on right now with like other communities. You know, they want you to finish. So Mitchell Park opens in December. <laughs> okay. So, you know, it's really good timing. Good and time. we don't go after every single project across the country. We have select projects that fit on our in alignment with our values and our goals yeah. and what we do, and, and that's where we go. You so the family in Montana? Um, my roommate actually lives in Hamilton. And my old my college, college roommate, roommate yeah. was here, Lisa Milch. She's a, uh, a, a doctor, lives in Hamilton, but uh, works in senior centers here. She and her daughter were in the back uh, before, so I 
come and, and visit. But just in terms of the collaborations and the teams and work, our availability. So uh, the Dayton Library Bond, $187 million, 17 projects we've been designing with four different architects of record, local architects that chose us and married them to the different uh, uh, teams there. And it's been working really well. Not the same. I wish CTA was <laughs> uh, there on uh, some of them. But you should call whoever's doing reference charge. You should call Tim Canvich. So these projects are all being bid. And now the locals are following up on the last uh, projects there as well. So we've got a lot of resources there. Like we put a lot of effort in, as you can uh, see, because we think that this is a really important opportunity for us that will be uh, get uh, principal uh, managing partners uh, uh, through it all. We'll have our cell phones uh, to do it. But you should. Uh, the Dayton client has worked with some of the others uh, who are part of other teams too. And so uh, it's rare that somebody, everyone will have their good reference and they're all excellent people. It's rare that you'll find people who've worked with multiple ones so that you can get compare and contrast and maybe they'll tell you what they like better about other teams or not. From a design perspective, from our perspective, we have the advantage of an uh, of a incredibly reasonable schedule that you have laid out, um, which is really nice and kind of refreshing. We can deliver on this. Uh, we, we delivered a four and a half million dollar project in six weeks last fall, at a time when our firm is busier than we have been since 2006. Surprising, I didn't think we'd ever be this busy again. And it's in our community. We're about to build 250 to 350 million dollars a year for the next 10 years. Just the projects we know about right now. That's going to stress every architect, every engineer, every general contractor, and every subcontractor. Thankfully, the oil field. Some of that labor is coming back. It's going to be an ongoing conversation when it gets to construction. But, but from an architecture perspective, one of our advantages is we have 400 people. And I have, this project will take 25 people when, when we're in second phase actually cre creating the, the construction documents. We have the resources and we have the planning time. But we're going to be want to, as a team, we're going to want to strategize the construction side and ask those same questions. Because it's not, I don't think this issue of labor and time is going to go away in the next couple of years. It's a whole new world for us in the last 24 months versus you know, 2008 to, to two years ago. We want to go back. We just have five minutes left. Do we want to go back to the trustees? Yeah, and so uh, perhaps if we uh, could hear things. So. Um, if I was to go to one, like, what's the nearest library to go to Brad? Well, I would still suggest going to the Bay Area just because there's the most, they're all within close distance and you can see, again, every building has different character, so definitely. Um, and virtual tours, we can put together virtual tours for you too. Um, we have good images and some of them still have fly-throughs. I think Captain Bay have a great fly-through, Mitchell Park had fly-throughs too. Sorry, you should know the uh, ALA American Library Association's annual conferences in San Francisco this year, as well as, a, uh, as, well as the Urban Library Council. And we're thinking of renting a, a, a bus and shuttling people between San Francisco and San Jose to take us. We have lots of clients who have not seen all of our uh, uh, portfolio. Uh, in Ohio, so, uh, thoughts or questions? Or? No, I, um, this is some of the things I on the side really like this. Um, and I also liked um, the front of the library where you have spectrum on there and the museum where you know, your presence is known to the public as they come by. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a picture of the staff space that you said you had on your laptop? We will send them to Jim, yes, definitely. Or we'll get them to Jim today. Absolutely. We do have pictures of staff spaces. Did I interrupt you, Ben? No. Okay, Could you, I mean, this is my brain is like our old meal right now, but could you just remind me of what you will do and what you will do and what yes. you're going to do? Perhaps what you two are going to do. Oh, okay. Like when we will be seeing you? You will see me regularly, yes. Very familiar face I will be, um, um, as with every project. So the programming, setting the project up, and getting the vision and the concept, all the way through conceptual schematic design, I will be integral to this project. 
Um, and then as it goes into the interiors and outreach continues throughout the project, if you want as much community outreach as I think you want, we're going to be doing the interiors and continuing with that as well. So all the way up to opening day, the participation from me will be as a key player. Okay? But my responsibility does shift as the project starts then going into the design phase. So the project design, so I'll be the lead designer and it's collaborative working with the, uh, the multiple talents of the uh, CTA architects and engineers and it's all uh, just giving the, the form. Uh, so that's why you're all excited about tweaking it. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, you're showing that's what you do. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's it. It's uh, super fun. Like, we have to cover, it's all, we're not siloed. Like, our office is, uh, we all have desks that are on wheels, and we rearrange as project teams, and uh, we have uh, lots of uh, uh, very capable uh, colleagues who uh, can help uh, take these models and say, you know, 3D print them and such. So we have a team that will come out and help facilitate as well. And then so we're going to be coming here in person a lot. And then my job becomes more intense as we get closer to actually producing that set of construction documents, bidding the project, talking about whether we're gonna, how we're we going to deliver this project. A lot of the nuts and bolts of delivery becomes my management role. How are we going to build a team of 15 people and who is it? Uh, we'll interact almost every day, I would imagine every day through the process. Um, we do a lot of that behind the scenes work and then once the project launches and through construction, then I take a lot of that responsibility on for dealing with the construction related issues. So it's, it's one architect brain <laughs> within three, with three brains. Then Randy is going to support the community engagement. Just because as you're looking at such, um, you know, a big part is the donor funding, having a local presence, having the local face is always nice, and there's not always the right, I mean, having options to pick the right face for the right task is really um, something we have found very beneficial for projects. And so if it is having, you know, the architects come in and present the design, fabulous. If it's just having somebody at an event to help mingle and do more of the community outreach and, you know, be there to converse and to help support other outreach efforts, I think, you know, having Randy here and being able to do that will be tremendous as well. Thank you. Well, that concludes. Thank you, everybody. Privilege. Thank you so much. <laughs>